Zoll Technology will guide you to meet the 2015 CPR guidelines. High quality resuscitation on the move is achievable and high perfusion CPR is within reach. When it comes to helping you deliver high quality CPR, no one offers you more than Zoll. Thank you. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I have, uh, I do consult for several of the companies in the lobby, but none of what I'll have to say today impacts that. Tomorrow it may. This is a very good start for why I believe PCI has an important role to play in adult cardiac arrest. 70% of adults who have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest turn out to have coronary artery disease. And often there is a culprit vessel that's responsible for that acute emergency, in other words, for their cardiac arrest. When I was a younger physician, I was taught that you could grade coronary disease from stable angina to unstable angina to a non-Q wave, now called a non-ST segment, to an acute infarction or ST segment elevation, and that was the worst. But I would suggest to you that there's actually one thing worse than an ST segment elevation MI, and that is sudden out-of-hospital cardiac arrest as your manifestation of coronary artery disease. The potential value for going to the cath lab and doing an angiogram as well as PCI are listed here. Finding that culprit, if that culprit is impeding flow, and often it's acutely occluded, restoring flow, salvaging myocardium, hopefully preventing rearrest, and even improving long-term outcome, we hope. Well, who should go? Let me take this on with two different categories that follow already what we've seen in algorithms presented this morning to look at the ECG first. There are now over 28 studies or cohort collections of patients with STEMI that have had temperature targeted or targeted temperature management, hypothermia, and gone early to the cath lab post arrest. Of those 2,700, 60% survived, and 86% of the survivors survived with good neurologic function. They returned home able to take care of themselves and presume their, or resume their previous life. Historically, it's important to realize that that number used to be 30% survival with only about 60 or even 50% returning to normal function. So we have doubled that with this type of approach. Well, it was really the first time that this was in guidelines was 2013. Actually, that's not true. If you look at the Europeans, it was 2012. The US followed a year later, and you'll recognize these approaches, but they've both now been given class one with moderate evidence that it should be done. To cool, even if they're associated with the STEMI, and then to go emergently and immediately to angiography and PCI when needed regardless of whether they're awake or comatose. This is the 2015 um, ILCOR statement just published that it is recommended in select adult patients with return of spontaneous circulation and ST elevation in their ECG that they go early to the cath lab. and that that should be done emergently, not sometime during their hospital course, but as the first real intervention simultaneously while they're being cooled. Again, class one. And finally, that it's reasonable not, regardless of whether they're awake or, or not, to take them. So that has become the standard of care in my field, interventional cardiology. You can no longer debate, well, he's, that patient is not awake or alert, and we don't know what their neurologic function will be if they have ST elevation after their resuscitation. They need to go emergently to the cath lab, just as if they had a STEMI without the complication of cardiac arrest. 
Well, what do you find if you take those patients to the cath lab? We actually looked at this through a registry called INCAR, or the International Cardiac Arrest Registry Cardiology Subset. In that, we had 750 patients who had all been resuscitated, and under post-resuscitation ECG, only about a quarter, 27%, had ST elevation. In fact, then, obviously, the majority do not, but about 25% do. If you take them early to the cath lab, 80% of the time, 8 out of 10, have an easily identified culprit vessel. That's actually no different than the non-cardiac arrest STEMI population. We take all of those without argument today, but we don't find an acutely occluded vessel 100% of the time. Thanks to the Japanese, we finally learned about Takasubu. Stress cardiomyopathy, I see those women not infrequently in Tucson, who in fact have absolute ST elevation, but do not have a coronary lesion, as well as some others who may have spasm or other causes of their ST elevation, but do not have an acutely occluded <coughs> culprit. But if you take these cardiac arrest patients and you find those eight out of 10 who do have a culprit, look at this, 93% of that group, that culprit is occluded. In other words, what do they need? They need immediate reperfusion to save their muscle. Interestingly, it's most commonly the left anterior descending and least frequently the circumflex. So LAD, right, and circ. Well, here's an example. A second year medical student might mistake this for a very wide bundle branch block, but you won't. This is obviously ST elevation in a big way with ST depression uh, reciprocal from an inferior STEMI post arrest. This patient actually had this cardiogram in their home after they were resuscitated prior to transport. We took that patient immediately to the cath lab and found, just like we do in 80%, a culprit. This is an acute marginal branch to the RV, but not the native right, which should be down here. And we quickly reopened that, restored that vessel, showing again the 80% with a culprit and 93% of the time that culprit's occluded right there. Okay? If you take those two numbers and multiply them, 80% have a culprit, 90% of the time that culprit's occluded. That translates into three out of four such patients post-arrest with ST elevation will have an acutely occluded culprit that begs to be opened now. Not tomorrow, not six hours later, but immediately upon arrival. Okay? So the early lessons learned, this is safe. People can get through this. And in fact, that the ECG is not a very good predictor of acutely occluded vessels post cardiac arrest. In fact, the first reports from the French in the 1990s suggested and emphasized that exact concept. Well, what does that mean then for that vast majority who do not have ST elevation? Should they be going to the cath lab? We do not take that group who are not post arrest urgently or emergently to the cath lab, we take them early, meaning 12 hours later. If it's on a Friday night, we'll take them Saturday morning, but we don't come in with the same urgency of 90 minutes to reperfusion. Nonetheless, the Europeans led the way in their statement in 2012 that we ought to at least consider taking this group since the ECG does not always identify those post-arrest by ST elevation at least, with an acutely occluded vessel. Here's what ILCOR did with that just recently. We suggest, again, not recommend, so you may say no thank you, but we suggest early emergent cardiac catheterization, again, and selected, gives you a little bit of clinical judgment area to say, no, this one's too old, or there's too many other problems but in those without ST elevation. So a little less forceful, <laughs> but still a strong suggestion that you consider taking them. Indeed, emergent coronary angiography is reasonable for the select patient post-arrest, but without ST elevation on their ECG. 
a 2A recommendation rather than A1. Well, just like in the ST elevation population post-arrest, in those without, there is no randomized data. Those 3,000 patients I showed you before were not randomized. They're simply before and after cohort studies. And they would be, as we've learned this morning, even initially judged as low quality evidence. But here's a study that we did from our registry, again, low quality by the strict rules. From that 750 patients with successfully resuscitated out of hospital cardiac arrest, we looked at only those with VF and only those in the VF group that did not have ST elevation. We did not tell the group how to treat them, but we watched and then looked who got treated how and what were the results. Lots of potential bias. Not proof, but a very strong signal that indeed going to the cath lab early, even without ST elevation, was a positive effect or association, perhaps better word, with better outcomes. Well, again, what do you find in this group if you take them early? We went back to that same paper, and we found that this time the culprit was only identified in one-third instead of 80%. But one-third is not a trivial number. And of those with a culprit, interestingly, almost 70% that culprit was occluded. Using this, and this time, interestingly, there was an equal distribution of which vessel? Well, here's an example. This is a cardiogram from a 40-year-old just a few minutes after successfully being resuscitated from out-of-hospital VF. He has sinus tachycardia and some minor ST uh, upsloping. Frankly, if this was a treadmill, you'd call this negative, but perhaps not quite normal, but no really clear ST elevation. But we took him to the cath lab because we couldn't figure out why he should have a cardiac arrest. Very active swimmer. And we found his LAD abruptly cut off right after the left main, just like we do in a third. And in fact, again, completely occluded, which we find 70% of the time. If you multiply this time, the third who's 70% of that third who have an acutely occluded vessel, one out of four. So the question really remains for the interventional community. Is one out of four enough to get you up at night? If it was one out of 100, we would not be doing this work. If it was one out of two or three out of four, we would, as evidenced by how we treat these, those with ST elevation. But as you can see, it's not just my group, but there are now five studies, including one from the national database of the American College of Cardiology, showing that though some variation, the average is 30% or one out of three. So I realize that most of you are not interventional cardiologists. I'm not looking for another reason to get up at midnight myself. I've been doing that for 30 years. I got all my gray hair that way. <laughs> but I have to admit, best patient care doesn't figure on what time of day or night. And I'm committed that, in fact, these patients should go early to the cath lab. Now, what is this select story all about? It was in both statements. It does give us some leeway and some clinical judgment to decide some patients may not be ideal. Both the Europeans, Marcos Noch and his group, and my group, which I'll show shortly, have looked at that very question. And here's what they thought, that if you do not have ST elevation post-arrest, right, that it's okay to stop in the ED and think of other possibilities. But be very careful, as you read this article, they strongly recommend this not be parking for six or eight hours. Within two hours, that decision should be made and you're on your way. That's not a whole lot different than 90 minutes, in my opinion, but even that makes me just a little nervous, okay? So we did the same thing on the other side of the Atlantic. We've been behind a year every time this topic comes out. I'm embarrassed by that, but that's why I've made friends with Marcos so I can move forward and get on the cutting edge. 
But we were asked by the ACC to put together a paper and we did this. We created an algorithm for those who I think many in the audience could be, those on the front line in the emergency department dealing with this problem. Do I call the interventional cardiologist or do I not? And that's what this is all about. I'm just gonna look at the non-ST segment elevation side. Again, rather than just charge ahead to the cath lab, it is okay to stop momentarily, not for two hours in our opinion, but momentarily consider other possibilities, assessing, consulting with interventional cardiology and intensive care, and then deciding. And perhaps the most important box is here in the middle. We know from literature search, this has not been validated yet. We're on that right now. But from a literature search, these 10 factors are associated with unfavorable outcomes post-arrest. Unwitnessed, non-VF, no bystander, no secrets there. Everyone in this audience knows that. More than 30 minutes to achieve a pulse. Ongoing CPR when you arrive at the hospital. pH less than 7.2, lactate greater than 7 or 8, over 85, end-stage renal disease, and non-cardiac, particularly traumatic arrest. We didn't know how many you need not to go. and We made no such statement. I personally believe one or even two is not enough reason to say I'm not taking that patient. But clearly, if you have seven out of eight or seven out of ten, no one would fault you if you said, I'm going to pass. Let's treat this one conservatively. Hopefully, and I have some fear about this, but hopefully this will not be used to deny patients this possibility for the best treatment, but it does give us some feel for those who may not benefit and gives us a moment of reflection. There's that same list. Well, at the end of the day, it all comes down to this question. Does it matter? Do our outcomes improved? In 2015 and 16, we still have no randomized data on this question, whether with or without ST segment elevation. But we have lots of cohort data now. In fact, in the last three months, there's been another 5,000 patients reported in the literature, including a nice report from the CARES registry with Brian McNally here to my right. One of the features that was mentioned, though not emphasized this morning, was that another important aspect to literature and evidence-based uh, research is the consistency. This data is overwhelmingly consistent. For whatever bias might be there, if you're deemed worthy to go to the cath lab, you will do better if you go. And now within that 8,000 patients, there's a 62% mean survival to discharge rate and almost 90%, 89% of survivors go home with good neurologic function. To me, it may not be proof positive, but it's pretty good evidence. Nonetheless, I live not just in the resuscitation world, I live in the interventional cardiology world. And in that world, they want randomized data and they want lots of it. I've been around the world twice. Singapore is one of the last places I haven't been. <laughs> given this same talk and everybody smiles at me and says, oh, great idea, and nobody does it. <laughs> and so in Europe and in the US, we have just embarked on two parallel. We specifically designed these two pilot studies to be compatible. We actually talked to each other and made it that way. This one is from Sten Rubertson, and he's about 70 patients in. Randomizing post-arrest patients without ST elevation to early cath or no early cath. And this one's mine. It took us a year to get approval in the US to do this. These patients cannot sign consent. They're comatose. But there is a mechanism in place where you can inform the community and move forward. It took, frankly, 15 months to get that done and approved. We just started. Stan is way ahead of me. I have one patient in my study. I can tell you this. So far, survival rate is 100% <laughs> with early calf. 
okay? But I believe this is the beginning to what we truly need. These are tough studies. I'm hoping to get 240 over three years. Stan is looking for 120. But if we combine those, we'll be close to 400. It still won't be a definitive answer, in my opinion, but will give us a hope, hopefully a good, strong signal that will allow us to go forth and get the millions of dollars that it would really take to definitively answer this question. I think we'll get it because this is a big, big issue all over the world and a big, important cost issue as well. If this works, we should do it. If it doesn't matter, we should save our money and use it in a better way. Well, in conclusions, no randomized proof to date, but good and numerous cohort before and after evidence that this could be the right thing to do. It's consistent, the outcomes can be excellent, and two small pilot studies are now underway to hopefully get more evidence, even in a randomized fashion. Thank you so much.